liquidation of those jewels. Day by day, over years, women were holding their children in their arms and pointing to the sky while they waited to take their place in blood-soaked communal graves. Twelve million men, women and children have died thus, murdered in cold blood. Millions upon millions more today mourn their fathers and their mothers, their husbands, their wives and their children. Rights as any man to mercy who has played a part, however indirectly, in such a crime. Let Graeber speak again of Dubno. The people who had got off the trucks, men, women and children of all ages, had to undress upon the orders of an SS man who carried a riding or dog whip. They had to put down their clothes in fixed places sorted according to shoes, top clothing, and underclothing. I saw a heap of shoes of about 800 to 1,000 pairs, great piles of underlinen and clothing. Without screaming or weeping, these people undressed, stood around in family groups, kissed each other, said farewells, and waited for a sign from another SS man who stood near the pit, also with a whip in his hand. During the 15 minutes that I stood near, I heard no complaint or plea for mercy. I watched a family of about eight persons, a man and a woman, both about 50, with their children of about one, eight, and 10, and two grown-up daughters of about 20 or 24. An old woman with snow-white hair was holding the one-year-old child in her arms and singing to it and tickling it. The child was cooing with delight. The couple were looking on with tears in their eyes. The father was holding the hand of a boy about 10 years old and speaking to him softly. The boy was fighting his tears. And the father pointed to the sky, stroked his head, and seemed to explain something to the boy. At that moment, the SS man at the pit shouted something to his comrade. The latter counted off about 20 persons and instructed them to go behind the earth mound. Among them was the family, which I have mentioned. I well remember a girl, slim and with black hair, who, as she passed close to me, pointed to herself and said, 23. I walked around the mound and found myself confronted by a tremendous grave. People were closely wedged together and lying on top of each other so that only their heads were visible. Nearly all had blood running over their shoulders from their heads. Some of the people shot were still moving. Some were lifting their arms and turning their heads to show that they were still alive. I was surprised that I was not ordered away. You were asked to believe that these 21 ministers and leading officers of state did not know of these matters, were not responsible. It is for you to decide. Some, it may be, are more guilty than others. Some played a more direct and active part than others in these frightful crimes. But when these crimes are such as you have to deal with here, slavery, mass murder and world war, when the consequences of these crimes are the deaths of over 20 million of our fellow men, the devastation of a continent, the spread of untold tragedy and suffering throughout the world, what mitigation is it that some took less part than others, that some were principals and others mere accessories? What matters it 
If some forfeited their lives only a thousand times, when others deserve a million deaths. In one way, the fate of these men means little. Their personal power for evil lies forever broken. They have convicted and discredited each other and finally destroyed the legend they created around the figure of their leader. But on their fate, great issues must still depend for the ways of truth and righteousness between the nations of the world, the hope of future international cooperation in the administration of law and justice are in your hands. This trial must form a milestone in the history of civilization, not only bringing retribution to these guilty men, not only marking that right shall, in the end, triumph over evil, but also that the ordinary people of the world, and I make no distinction now between friend and foe, are now determined that the individual must transcend the state. The state and the law are made for man, that through them he may achieve a fuller life, a higher purpose, a greater dignity. States may be great and powerful. Ultimately, the rights of men, made as all men are made in the image of God, are fundamental. When the state, either because as here, its leaders have lusted for power and place, or under some specious pretext that the end may justify the means, affronts these things, they may for a time become obscured and submerged, but they are imminent, and ultimately they will assert themselves more strongly still, their imminence more. Liberty, love, understanding comes to this court and cries, these are our laws, let them prevail. And then shall those other words of Goethe be translated into fact, not only, as we must hope, of the German people, but of the whole community of men. Thus ought the German people to behave, giving and receiving from the world their hearts open to every fruitful source of wonder, great through understanding and love, through mediation and the spirit, thus ought they to be. That is their destiny. You will remember when you come to give your decision the story of Dubno, but not in vengeance, in a determination that these things shall not occur again. The father, do you remember, pointed to the sky and seemed to say something to his boy.